Hello there, this is your instructor John speaking. This is the EMGM 106 course lecture for Medical Control and Specialty Resource Centers. So we have about 19 emergency rooms open right now in the county. Uh, one is being built right now, so by the end of the year we'll have, we'll have 20. Uh, what makes these, these emergency rooms basic emergency facilities is they have a doctor on duty 24 hours a day to render care. Uh, more than likely as an EMT, you'll be transporting to most of these hospitals here in the county if you do work you know, on an ambulance. Uh, if you do have a patient uh, who's going to emergency room and they're stable patients, they have a, a minor complaint, stable vital signs, they're completely oriented, uh, you're going to contact whatever hospital they want to go to and by BLS radio frequency. And what's going to happen is, is when you hail the hospital, hey, BLS 25 calling Kaiser Zion, Kaiser Zion's going to answer. And a nurse is going to answer the BLS radio and, and say hi. And you're going to tell them what you have to give them your ETA to the hospital. Uh, and they're going to say thank you very much. And all this really is is just a courtesy call that we're coming to your facility, we'll be there in 15 minutes, and please have a bed ready, if possible. Uh, what they cannot do uh, via the base, uh, basic uh, BLS radio is they're unable to provide online medical direction. So you can't ask them questions on how to treat the patient, things like that. If you need medical direction, you need to call a base hospital. And these are the base hospitals that are licensed here in the county of San Diego. What makes them licensed base hospitals is they have a, uh, a physician on duty 24 hours a day who, who knows our protocols, who's licensed with the county of San Diego as a pre-hospital care provider physician. And we can, we, can, uh, we can take their orders, we can follow their orders, uh, it, as if they were in the room next to us rather than over the radio. Also, with the base hospitals, there's also a base hospital nurse. You see her right there. And you'll be probably more likely speaking to that person uh, initially when you do talk on the radio. And this nurse, because they're also trained in our protocols, can relay the physician's orders through to you, and you can follow those, those orders. They're great resources for us. If you need additional doses of medication, if you have uh, questions about where to you know, transport this patient, what hospital is the best hospital for this person. And, and of course, now there is a, a base hospital radio frequency. So there are two separate frequencies. So if you have a stable patient going to any emergency room, you contact that, that emergency room on your BLS radio. If you have a uh, more critical patient that needs to go, you're having a heart attack, a stroke, a CPR, those types of things, you're going to contact a base hospital. Now, the base hospital that you contact might not be the hospital you're actually going to. So you are going to Kaiser, but you're going to Kaiser with a person who's having a stroke. So you're going to call, say, Mercy Hospital, and you give them the report, and then they call by telephone, they call Kaiser to let them know you're coming. It's kind of roundabout. What's good about this is, is that when you call the base hospital and you speak to the, the nurse on the on the radio, uh, this all gets recorded. And these recordings have to be on file for 10 years. So if there are issues with your call, if you go to court, you'll have that recording available uh, in the court of law. So base hospital contact criteria. So if you have a patient and you're in the ambulance with the patient and they have abnormal vital signs, grossly abnormal vital signs, if they're, if they're altered in some way, they're confused, disoriented, unconscious, drunk, overdosed on drugs, they need to, uh, you need to call base hospital. Any of your enhanced skills, so if you provide Narcan, epinephrine, AED, King Airway, uh, those types of things, you'd have to definitely document and, of course, call a base hospital. Um, if you have a pediatric patient, uh, anyone under the age of 18 you're dealing with, you definitely want to call, no matter what the outcome is, you want to call a base hospital uh, with this emergency patient. And of course, if you're performing an AMA 
and the base hospital criteria is present, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, uh, then you call them as well. And, and anytime you need any kind of, you have questions or you, you understanding, you want to know where to go, they're the best resource for you. So other resources available here in the county, we have STEMI and stroke centers. Uh, STEMI center is a cardiac center. Uh, STEMI stands for ST elevation myocardial infarction. Basically, it's the big heart attack. And with the big heart attack and people having strokes, the one common thing with this is, is both in both cases, tissue is being damaged, whether it's the heart or whether it's the brain. So if you think of these people, even though we know that they're considered medical patients with medical complaints, you got to think these people also are having traumatic injuries to their organs. So you want to get them to a STEMI center or a stroke center, depending on the circumstances, as quickly and safely as you can. So that would be the closest center uh, to you, depending on the circumstances. Again, the base hospital can tell you where to go, uh, which STEMI centers open, which stroke centers open. You want to get them uh, to those hospitals. It is a, these are time-sensitive injuries, even though they're medical patients. Uh, speaking of, uh, of trauma, we have these five trauma centers uh, in the county of San Diego, plus Rady's Children's uh, Pediatric Center as well. Uh, so we only have one level one trauma center for, for civilians anyway. And that's UCSD Hillcrest. And they can handle everything. They handle kids. They handle adults. They handle burns, hyperbaric chamber, all kinds of lovely stuff there. Uh, but there's other ones as well. We have Scripps La Jolla, Mercy, Sharp, and Palomar. They're level two trauma centers. They handle anyone who's 15 years of age or older. And, of course, Children's Hospital deals with anyone who's less than 15 years of age. There's also a, a secondary uh, pediatric trauma center, and that again is UCSD Hillcrest. If for some reason Children's is, you know, on bypass or something. Additional resource centers: uh, you have labor and delivery departments. So if you have a patient who's equal or greater than 20 weeks gestation, so they're 20 weeks along in their pregnancy, uh, and they're having some kind of pregnancy issue or delivery issue going on, you want to take them to a hospital that has a labor and delivery department. And if this is a really uh, early in their pregnancy, the 20, 24, 26, 28 weeks, 30 weeks, these are called preemie. And uh, these preemies, if they do deliver, they need a NICU. A NICU is a neonate intensive care unit. So if you're going to go to a labor and delivery hospital, ask over the radio from the base hospital, is there a NICU working? Is it up, up, up and running right now? Because this little tiny, poor little thing is going to need to go into the NICU. UCSD is also a burn center. So again, there's more resources there. There's also a hyperbaric chamber for scuba diving and carbon monoxide poisoning. And we have one uh, county mental health facility that's off of Rosecrans, down off of the five there. And you might transport someone who's having a uh, psychiatric meltdown there to allow them to be held for 72 hours to be evaluated and treated and then transferred to another facility. Legal stuff. So this, this is just, just a few things that I've noticed out in the field that is kind of problematic for EMTs as, as well as paramedics. A lot of it's lack of understanding or uh, clarity, I guess. So against medical advice, you've had this lecture already. If you remember back on the first day of class, uh, you learned about AMAs, against medical advice. This is someone who has some type of medical or traumatic injury going on, but they don't want to go to the hospital. So if they have any kind of abnormal vital signs, if they have any kind of you know, uh, altered mental status, if you think they're impaired by drugs or alcohol, um, if they're high-risk populations, so little kids versus old people, if at any time advanced care was performed, like prior to your arrival by doctors, nurses, paramedics at scene. Um, these all need base hospital contact. Uh, so you're going to call the hospital, you explain what's going on, and you're going to get approval from the nurse on the radio to, uh, to allow this person to sign the AMA and to go on their way. If this person is a stable patient with a single, a single complaint that's not significant, a cut on the foot, 
a twisted ankle, uh, those types of you know minor things like that. Uh, and this this is a, this is a, this is a low risk population. They're young, healthy people. Their vital signs are all normal. Uh, this person does not need base hospital contact criteria. All you're going to do is you're going to have them sign the document. You're going to sign the AMA. You're going to get a witness to sign. And basically what you're saying is that you and the patient both agree that they don't need to go to the hospital today by ambulance. Now, AMAs can be used also for things like this person does want to be transported, but they don't want your interventions. So this person's having a heart attack. You want to help them with their nitro. They say, no, I don't want it. Uh, someone's fallen off, uh, fallen off their bicycle and they have neck pain. And even though you want to apply a cervical collar and put them in C-spine, they say, no, I don't want that collar. You can, you can actually write a, a partial AMA specific to that treatment or even destination. So let's say they, they want to go to one hospital, but because of your experience, you think they're better served at another hospital. You can have them sign these AMAs uh, attesting to the fact that they've declined your, you know, your treatment or your destination. Law enforcement at scene. So law enforcement at scene can be problematic for us. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to know the status of the patient. Are they under arrest in custody or are they detained? So if they're in custody and they're under arrest, the patient has lost their, their right to uh, refuse care or treatment or transport. If they're just detained, they're being held pending some kind of clearance, then this person has full patient rights to refuse your treatment, assessment, and transport. If the patient is under arrest or in custody and you're transporting the patient, uh, the officer is going to make the, the, the choice of destination. A lot of these uh, police departments and, and uh, sheriff's departments, they're contracted with specific hospitals that save them money, essentially. Uh, and so you're going to go more than likely where they want you to go. Now, there are some minor exceptions, but mostly you're going to go to those destinations they choose. The patient's going to be in handcuffs or plastic ties. The cop has to be with you in the back of the ambulance or following directly behind you in the car, just in case the patient has to be released for some reason. So again, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of problematic. Uh, they're in charge of the patient. The officer makes those decisions about the patient's medical care if they're in custody. Now, working with paramedics. So, you know, as an EMT in the county of San Diego on a fire truck or an ambulance, you're going to be working with paramedics, nurses, doctors, and you're going to be doing a lot of the, the grunt work that these people you know, aren't going to want to do. You're going to be attaching the EKG leads. You're going to be setting up IVs, getting blood sugars, oxygen saturation levels, end tile sampling, and all that stuff. So I want to go through this. I've got a couple of videos attached to the module that will help you understand some of this stuff a little better. So electrocardiogram. So you're at, even if you're going out to your clinical experience time at Mercy or wherever you're going for here from Miramar, uh, more than likely they're going to have you do this. So this is uh, the upper box here. This shows what's called the limb leads. And traditionally these four leads, the white, black, red, and green leads, would go on the limbs themselves. They go on the backs of the hands and the tops of the feet. Uh, but because we're an EMS, and because we work in a, uh, in a very kind of unstable environment with movement of the gurney and movement of the ambulance and artifacts and all that, we found that putting them on the torso, as you see in the diagram, actually works out a little better for getting a clearer picture of this person's you know, heart rhythm and all that. So you can see the white goes to the upper right, black goes on the left arm, and then you have left uh, leg is red and the right leg is green. Uh, you can see where the placement is. Again, I have this video coming up here uh, that you guys can, uh, like a five-minute video, you guys can see how these things are placed. So pretty much everyone that has any most kind of indications for this is going to be anything, any elderly person, chest trauma, uh, any patient with abnormal vital signs, someone who's taken a drug that whether it's on purpose or by mistake that might cause cardiac effects or maybe the, the medic is going to give a medication that causes possible cardiac effects. Uh, 
Again, you're monitoring the heart. This is called a non-diagnostic electrocardiogram. So we're just monitoring for abnormalities. It doesn't really tell us what's going on specifically. If the doctor, nurse, or medic wants a diagnostic uh, electrocardiogram, then you'll be doing a 12-lead EKG on the patient. So you can see you already have the four leads in place, the right upper, left, uh, left arm, and then left leg and right leg in place, like you see in the upper box. But you're going to add these six more leads. They're called V-leads. And we're going to locate the intercostal spaces, which are the gaps between the ribs on your chest. And we're going to place these in a very specific order. And again, the video will show you how to do this. And then when we have all these 10 leads on the patient, four of the upper, these, uh, these upper leads here, and then six of these other ones in the lower picture, then we can obtain this 12 lead EKG, which gives us a, a, like a, like a three-dimensional picture of what's going on with the heart. And it can actually be, be diagnostic. It can tell us whether this person's having a heart attack or having some kind of conduction issue or something like that. Again, indications vary. But, you know, cardiac is issues, altered mental status, dizziness, uh, fainting spells, respiratory issues, there's a whole long list of indications, but there's just some of them I could think of offhand. I intravenous fluids. So there's three sizes of EMS pre-hospital bags you'll be carrying on a paramedic unit. You have 100 milliliter bag, 250 milliliter bag, and 1,000 ml bag. So you'll be spiking these bags, you'll be assembling them for the medic. Along with this is you're going to have IV tubing sets, like you see in the lower picture here. They usually come in two configurations. One's a 10-drop and one's a 60-drop. So the 10-drop is called a maxi-dripper. And if you just think about a maxi-dripper, it provides the maximum amount of fluids. So for every 10 drops that comes out of that bag, the patient gets one milliliter of fluid. On the other side of this, on a 60 dropper, it's called a mini dripper. And for every 60 drops, the patient gets one milliliter. So if a patient's in shock and their blood pressure is low, you'd want to have that 1,000 cc or 1,000 milliliter IV bag attached to this 10 drop per minute maxi dripper to provide the maximum amount of fluids in the shortest amount of time. On the other hand, if the medic wants to administer medications intravenously, but, but the patient does not need fluids, then maybe a 250cc bag or even a 100cc bag is, is actually more than adequate. But then you'd be using a mini dripper because you want the medication to go in slowly and steadily. So just depending on the circumstances of what's going on with the patient, the medic will tell you what to do, which one to, which one to set up. And again, I have a video on how to set these up to help you understand better. Uh, you will be getting uh, a lot of blood sugars in the field. Again, this is another another skill that the medics will palm off on EMTs. It's that they can do other things more important, talk to the patient or talk on the radio, whatever they're doing, but get a, get a good blood sugar on the patient. Same thing with oxygen saturation levels. You've, you've already had uh, lectures on this. You've already used the finger probes in the, in the, uh, in the lab when you're doing your medical, your medical assessment and all that. I just wanted to point out with this is there's also a, an adhesive band-aid version of this. They call it a pediatric probe. Even though it's a pediatric probe and it's used primarily for small children and infants, you can use this on adults as well, especially ones you're having trouble getting a good reading on because of cold hands or whatever reason. Just wrap it around their finger, their fingernail, their toenail, and it's, it's a lot more accurate sometimes. Uh, end tidal uh, CO2 sampling. So uh, you can see from the uh, the pictures here is there's two types of this, and you'll be doing these in the field for the medics, maybe even the hospital for the nurse. There's inline sampling, and you can there's that little tube goes on the BVM and it attaches to the advanced airway, or you could actually have just a regular old bag valve mask on that as well. And that little tubing that comes off the side goes to this monitor right here. And what you're getting is you're getting this waveform. It's this lower waveform, this kind of boxy looking brown waveform. And that's telling me that every time this, that waveform rises up, it tells me how much carbon dioxide is being released. 
and how long it's taking this person to take a breath out and then a breath in. So it's giving me a really good indicator of how well this person's breathing, how well he's getting rid of his carbon dioxide. Um, we use this on every unconscious patient, any patient that we're ventilating with a bag valve mask, whether it's by mask or whether it's with an advanced airway like you see in the picture here, they're going to get an inline sampling device hooked up almost immediately. It's very diagnostic for the medics. They watch these waveforms carefully. They can tell when people are recovering, when they're getting worse. It's a great device. Uh, there's a nasal version as well. This person's awake, semi-awake, semi-conscious, unconscious, but they're breathing fine on their own. They don't need bag valve mass ventilations. Um, and this goes in their nose. Now, it's, it's also a nasal cannula. So you, you can provide one to six liters of oxygen through this device. But that little cup you see over the lips right there, that, that captures the, the release of carbon dioxide from the person's mouth. And it gives a waveform as well. So if you have a, if a medic has someone who's semi-conscious, they're overdosed on a drug, they're, uh, they're really drunk, they're having a stroke, they're having some kind of respiratory difficulty, asthmatic or something like that, they're going to want you to place one of these on the patient, hook it up to the monitor, so they can monitor this person throughout the call. And if the person stops breathing or the breathing becomes ineffective, the monitor will actually send off a message to warn the, the medic that things have changed. It's a great way of, of having some, like, a, like a third person back there monitoring you know, the patient. BLS downgrades. So this is a case where there's a 911 call that's been generated. They send out a paramedic unit. The paramedic gets out there. They, they assess the patient. They determine that the patient uh, does not need to go to the hospital by ALS. So they call uh, a BLS ambulance and you guys show up. Now, while you're going to this call, the medics are already at scene. They've already made base hospital contact. Um, they've already got approval from the base hospital nurse to allow you to transport this patient. So more than likely, this patient is a stable patient. There's no interventions that have been done. There's no treatment that's indicated or anticipated. So again, the, as long as the medic was truthful about their assessment over the radio, uh, this person should be stable and you have every, every right to take this person to the hospital on your BLS ambulance. Again, if you're not comfortable, if you think that there's something that the medic might have missed or that you're concerned about the patient's status, that there may be unstable patients, you can decline. Uh, if you feel you're not comfortable taking this patient, but otherwise, you know, uh, everything should be fine as long as they've got approval from the hospital. And that's it, we're done. See how happy they are that we're done. Everyone's smiling. See you guys in class.